All right. Welcome, everyone, and may the fourth be with you. My name is Lauren Kaiser. I'm a staff strategic project manager at Toyota Research Institute. This is my third Women Transforming Technology Conference and my second year on the Emerging Leadership Planning Committee. I am so excited to introduce our next speaker. Joe Miller is dedicated to helping women around the world become powerhouse leaders they were meant to be. She delivers more than 70 presentations globally every year and has spoken in Europe, North America, Latin America, Asia Pacific, the Middle East, and on Zoom. Her book, which is titled Woman of Influence, Nine Steps to Build Your Brand, Establish Your Legacy, and Thrive, was published by McGraw-Hill in 2019. It was a number one best-selling new release on Amazon and has sold more than 10,000 copies. Today, Joe will inspire you to shift your mindset from doing to leading. Joe, uh, last November, Joe celebrated four years free from breast cancer. Joe believes that like, when life hands you lemons, you should stuff them in your bra and sing, ta-da! Please give a warm welcome to Joe Miller. Thank you so, so much for that fabulous introduction. Ta-da! And before I do or say anything, could everyone please join me in giving Lauren and Irma and Pinya, who are our session support crew, uh, along with Deanna, um, our conference organizer, and all of our session sponsors, could you join me in giving them all a very warm, wel uh, very warm uh, welcoming round of applause? This is how we do it these days everyone. And then can I encourage you to do something that we don't do nearly enough, um, which is a dedicate this time to yourself and your career and leadership development. And so this is going to seem a little cheesy, but could you go ahead and raise your right hand? Go on, everyone, raise your right hand up nice and high. Thank you. Drop it down behind your shoulders and just give yourself a pat on the back for being here. And I really mean it from the heart. Thank you for devoting this time to yourself and your career and leadership development. And look, as uh, we're getting started here, I have a poll that I'd love for you to take. Go ahead and open up pollev.com forward slash leaderly. And I'm gonna ask if Lauren, if you wouldn't mind just paste that one into the chat one more time. So Lauren's gonna drop the URL into the chat, go ahead and take our poll. And I know many of you are fans of data. Um, I'll be sharing some data as it relates to our group as we get a little bit further into the session. Um, but look, welcome to the session, everyone. We're talking about getting your shift together with five ways to lift your head up and refocus where you place your attention by shifting your mindset uh, away from doing so less doing and more leading as a way of becoming that powerhouse leader that you were meant to be. Um, and look, I know for those of you who've not worked with me before, you probably have a question as we're getting started, which is where is her accent from? Um, so let me share with you, like many of you, I'm not living and working in the place, which is where I grew up. I grew up in Australia and then lived in the Bay Area in California for about a decade. And then uh, another decade ago, relocated to Cedar Rapids in Iowa, where I'm coming to you live from today. So my journey has been Australia to California to Iowa. So as the only Australian women's leadership coach in the entire state of Iowa, I just figure that I have some unique qualifications to share with you. So in case anyone's wondering, yes, I am totally qualified to, to be here with you today. Um, but as we're getting started, if uh, you would like, um, I'd love to hear from you. So go ahead and open up the chat in the Hoover app and type a note and let me know where you're joining from today and something that inspired you to be here. So where are you joining from? What inspired you to dedicate this time to yourself and your career in leadership development and building resilience today? So it would be terrific to hear from you. So I want to start by sharing a story that was the inspiration that led me to write my book, the one that Lauren mentioned as we were getting started, Woman of Influence, but also the inspiration for this session today. And it's a conversation that I had about a decade ago with a woman who said, 
I feel like I am the best kept secret in my organization. She said, I feel like I'm the invisible employee. And what had happened to her was she'd become indispensable for doing work that downplayed her potential, that undersold all that she was capable of. And not surprisingly, that was really holding her back from advancing along her chosen career trajectory. And so what had happened was she'd become indispensable for doing work that downplayed her potential, that undersold everything that she brought to the table. And of course, being indispensable in your current role won't necessarily drive your career forward. So she and I had a fairly in-depth conversation about that and took a look together at all of the raw leadership strengths that she possessed that were going unseen and under leveraged. And she looked for ways to use those strengths more in her day-to-day -day work and uh, ways to shift her mindset from doing to leading so she could start to make a, a broader impact through the power of her leadership strengths. And as she started to drive more valuable results, she wasn't shy about making her value and her strengths and her accomplishments known. So that as time went by, everyone around her started to sit up and pay attention and see the leader in her. But I think even more importantly than that, she began to see the leader in herself. And so in our time ahead today, we're going to look at first um, at the importance of owning and embracing and unapologetically leveraging your leadership strengths. And then what are the reasons why influencing without authority is one of the most important and relevant leadership skills for people in today's workforce, especially if you want to be that resilient contributor or resilient leader. But then most of our time is going to be dev devoted to walking through five key shifts in mindset and behavior to help you shift from doing to leading. And then I'll have a final quick tip right at the end um, that's all about ways to not be that best kept secret in the organization. So that's what's ahead. I'm thrilled to have you join me here today. And um, I just have one question for you. Have you ever felt like you were that best kept secret in the organization at any moment in your career today or in the past? If so, could you do me a favor and type the word me? into the chat. Go ahead and type me into the chat if that's ever been you. Have you ever been that best kept secret in the organization? And I see you, Rocky, Amira, Jamie, Karen, Sarah, Nancy, all, all caps and exclamation point there from Nancy. And um, right now our chat stream is looking a little bit like the lyrics to that great Alicia Keys song where the chorus just goes, me, 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 me. All right, me, 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 me. <laughs> Thanks, Val, Rachel, Leslie. I hear you, I see you. I think we can all relate. And look, if you're concerned that your colleagues or your boss or even your boss's boss's boss might be joining the session today, might be watching the chat stream, um, just go ahead and stare at that screen and blink your eyes twice for me. I think we can all relate. We've all felt like that best kept secret in the organization at some point in our career. And so the fundamental principle that forms the foundation for everything that we're going to cover here today is that I don't want you to become indispensable for doing work that downplays your potential, that undersells all that you're capable of. And that's especially important right now because compared to our collective lifetimes, our collective history, I would say that there's never been a more important moment to ask ourselves, who am I as a leader really? And what do I bring to the table that I can use to you know, solve the really big endemic problems that our world is facing right now, or be the one to spot a leadership gap and close that leadership gap. So there's never been a more important moment for you to ask yourself, what are my innate leadership strengths and how can I own those and amplify them and employ them 
to make the type of leadership in, impact that our world really needs right now, because this is no time for one size fits all leadership, is it? And if there's one way to be a resilient contributor or a resilient leader, it's to own and unapologetically embrace your authentic leadership strengths, which you can do at any moment in your career, by the way. You don't need the title or the team to be a leader because leadership is an action, not a position. So with that, if you know what some of your top leadership strengths are, um, don't be shy, type a note into the chat. And now is a great moment to own them, claim them, remark on them. So again, don't be shy, type a note into the chat and tell us what are one, two or three of your top leadership strengths? And in a moment, I'm gonna invite Lauren to call out uh, some of those answers. Um, but look, claiming your value starts with understanding where your power comes from. So one of the greatest gifts you can give to yourself at any moment in your career is to unapologetically unleash those leadership strengths. My research partner, Selena Rezvani, much like myself, has interviewed many hundreds of very seasoned, very successful female leaders. And one of her observations was that those leaders didn't get to where they are today by hammering themselves on their weaknesses. No, they got to where they are by identifying and owning their strengths, turning those strengths into superpowers and harnessing those superpowers to the benefit of their organizations and to the benefit of their career. Um, so what I'm seeing right now is uh, a lot of great examples of your leadership superpowers coming in over the chat stream. Um, Laura, uh, Lauren, do you want to unmute here for a moment and, and call out some of those that are catching your eye? Absolutely. We've gotten some great uh, responses here. Um, and I just want to say I apologize in advance if I get anyone's name wrong. Um, I am definitely doing my best, but I thought uh, some, some that I've seen, uh, Rocky says approachable, um, and Sharon mentioned connection, both Prasanna and Lisa um, mentioned listening, uh, being good listeners. Um, I see empathy here from Karen, uh, oh, and from Uma as well. Um, oh, and Nancy just mentioned vulnerability and authenticity. Ah, oh, these are phenomenal. And, and you know, what I love, Lauren, is just the incredible diversity of the strengths that we're seeing. Um, and I just feel like what an honor it is to spend a bit of time today with a group that has the, these incredible, diverse leadership strengths. Um, do you see maybe one or two more that you'd like to call out? Yeah, some new ones that just came in. Patricia just said creativity and Mariana partnership. Um, and we got, of course, uh, some more listening from Florence. So. Hey, fantastic, everyone. We'll keep them coming. And look, if you're listening in and you're scratching your head and you're not entirely certain what your top leadership strengths are, or if it's just been a while since you paused to consider those and, you know, maybe they've shifted or changed a little later in the session, I'm going to give you a link to grab some resources, including the slides. Um, but one of the fantastic freebie resources that I've created for you is a list of 100 leadership strengths um, gained from uh, checking in with groups just like yourself, um, but it's a checklist you can use to go through and identify, say, your top three to really understand what's your signature leadership style and strengths right now at this moment in time. Um, and look, you know, this is, again, super important because one of the things I want you to do is to not only know what your leadership strengths are, um, but to share them with the world. And as Rohini Anand, uh, who is Chief Diversity Officer with Sodexo, has said, be authentic about your own leadership style. Don't fight it. Don't try and change it, but own it, communicate it, put a value on it and put a brand on it. So build a personal brand around those leadership strengths, up level your personal brand into a leadership brand. And of course, I'll be sharing some tips on how to do that as we get a little further into the session. Um, 
But look, one of the most important settings in which you can demonstrate who you are as a leader and all that you bring to the table is when you're working in groups and working in teams. However, the nature of those teams has been changing a lot in recent years. What percentage of US employees do you think are matrixed to some extent today, meaning they work on multiple different teams every single day? Uh, go ahead and type your best guess into the chat. So what percentage of US-based employees are working across multiple teams in the course of a single day. Uh, Lauren, oh wow, these are coming in way too fast. You want to call <laughs> out some, some high and some low answers and a, and a handful in between? Yes, of course. So I do see here um, in the 70s range, we've got uh, Denise and Rocky both said uh, 75% and Roberta at 70%. Uh, Kristen as well. Uh, Brooke, I think, might have the highest at 90%. Um, and then down at the lower end, we've got Tina with 25%. And um, oh, now we're back up to some high here. I see uh, Gladys and Shilpa at, and Brenda at 95%, Natalia at 100%. Um, so we definitely are seeing a range here, but at, mostly at the higher end of the spectrum. Yeah, we've got our optimists and our pessimists and people who are kind of the middle of the road. I should just reveal the answer at this point, shouldn't I? It is 84%. By the way, did anyone guess 84 right on the nose? Um, and if I... not, was anyone at 85? Who was our winner? Who was our closest? I think Trinity had 80%. Um, oh, and so did uh, Hima. Hima. I'm not 100% sure, I'm sorry. Uh, and Anandi also at 80%. Um, and then we spike into the 90s. Okay, fantastic. Let's do this. I'm going to be giving away some signed hardcover copies of my book during the session, and we'll be a little bit random. We're going to choose three of you who contribute through the session. Um, Trinity, I'm going to pick you as our winner. Um, and would you go ahead, if you're able, and just text your email uh, to uh, Lauren or to any of the panelists or organizers in the session? So Trinity, you're our first winner. Anyway, uh, back, to, back to the stats. So 84% of US employees are matrix now to some extent today, meaning working on multiple teams every single day. If that's been part of your recent experience, would you go ahead and just type yes into the chat? Type yes into the chat if you find yourself working across multiple different groups and teams in the course of a single day. Here come the yeses, too many to-, to Wow. Patricia, Shopa, Julie, Mariana, Kimberly. All right. So what the same study from McKinsey and company also found is that teams are more rapidly forming and disbanding and forming and disbanding at a much more rapid churn. So consider whether that's been your recent experience. And if you've noticed that more rapid churn in team formation of late, type the word yep into the chat. If you're watching the more rapid change in team formation, type yep into the chat. All right, we have lots and lots of yeps with varying capitalization. I'm surprised we don't even have a yup so far. <laughs> Alternate spellings are absolutely welcome here. So look, um, what all of this means is that the skill of leading without authority, influencing others when you're not necessarily the one in charge, influencing without positional power is one of the most critical and relevant skills that we can acquire in today's workforce and an absolute must have if you want to be resilient in, in your professional life. Um, a friend of mine went so far as to say, if you can learn to lead without positional power, you are set for life. So look, go ahead and type heck yeah into the chat, my friends, if you would like to be set for life. 
who would like to be set for life? Anyone, anyone type heck yeah into the chat. Oh, here we come. We have heck yeah, heck yeah, multiple different spelling. Oh, a thousand percent. All right. So we are in the right place. Um, so you guessed it. Um, the, the fundamental skill that we'll be building on as our platform here today is the skill of influencing without authority, leading with or without positional power. And so as we work our way through the session, I'm going to be sharing five key skills that you can use to influence without authority or lead when you're not necessarily the one in charge. Because there will be certain key pivot points in your career when the skills and competencies that got you to where you are today aren't the same ones that will get you to your next leadership milestone. In fact, if you insist on gripping on too tightly to those early career success factors, you might actually throttle the life out of your career by holding on too tightly to those early career skills. You might actually derail yourself. As Marshall Goldsmith said, what got you here won't necessarily get you there. So ahead, we're going to be walking through five skills you can use to shift your mindset and behavior from doing to leading, five skills to lead with influence, not positional power. Um, and look, some of these are going to be more relevant to your situation than others. So as we step through the five, I want you just to listen out for which one of these or, or which two in particular, say, are going to be um, representative of the most important shift you'll focus on in order to bring your leadership strengths to the fore. So which of these shifts is going to be most critical and relevant to your leadership development in the next year? All right. You ready for shift number one? Here we go. It's shifting from tactician to strategist, from tactician to strategist. And uh, look, right now, I know some of you are going, all right, sounds good, but what does that really mean? Because I can almost guarantee that everyone's received feedback like this at some point in your career. Someone said to you, you need to be more strategic. And, uh, you know, maybe it was that you delivered a presentation and someone said, look, great work, you, but... I'd love to see you be more strategic in your future presentations. Or maybe you sat down for that one-on-one -on -one performance review with your manager and they said, look, you're doing great. Um, however, here's what I'd like you to focus on going forward. I'd like to see you be more strategic. Okay, great. We've all heard feedback like this, but what does it really mean? And how do you go from being reactive and tactical to thinking and operating more strategically? And is that even possible to do when you don't have anyone to delegate to? So like you, I had questions and I went in search of answers and spoke to some very seasoned strategic leaders, uh, one of whom that really stood out was uh, my conversation with Ellie Humphrey. And Ellie is the VP of Enterprise Excellence with Medtronic. But when she and I spoke, she was Medtronic's Vice President of Global Strategy, traveling the world to work with Medtronic's top leadership teams to formulate and implement their global strategy. So when I asked Ellie, what does it mean to be strategic? She came up with this fantastic answer. She said, strategy is just a fancy word for coming up with a long-term plan and putting it into action. Do you like that? So strategy is just that fancy word for coming up with your long-term plan and putting it into action. So if you are approaching your work with that long-term future forward focused, if, if you've got goals or uh, an end game or a vision that you're moving toward, and if you're coming up with some type of plan and you're checking off milestones on the way to that end game, that's it. You are, you're doing it. You're being strategic. Strategy is nothing but the fancy word for having that plan and putting it into action. Another of the strategic leaders that I really enjoyed speaking with is Donna Munch, who uh, back at that moment in time was VP of Cloud Operations with NetApp. And I, I, I would guess that there might even be one or two of you in this session who know Donna and maybe even have had the, the privilege of working with her. She's a fantastic leader. Um, so Donna told me a story about how 
early on in her career when she just started out as a project administrator with HP, she was super inspired by her dad and her father's work ethic. And so Donna would come to work every day ready to attack the to-do list and crush it. No one could check tasks off the task list quite like Donna. She said, I started out as the ultimate tactician, which served her well, at least for a while. But then the day came when Donna spotted a more senior level job opening that she aspired to move into and she applied and was knocked back and was told, no, we can't promote you. You're too valuable where you are. No one can figure out how the heck to replace you. And so that was Donna's big aha moment, the, the cause of a massive pivot in her career trajectory because she realized that my get it done mentality as the go-to person and the only one who knew how to do certain things got in my way of moving ahead and I couldn't step out of my own role to take on new opportunities. So she couldn't step away to take on broader responsibilities. So I just want you to pause for a moment and think about whether that's ever been you. And I want you to know that with that insight, Donna made a, a huge pivot in where she placed her focus. So she went from being the ultimate tactician to being more forward thinking and planful, being more of a strategist. And as she started to be more strategic, she got recognized for that strategic focus and um, was given direct reports and then teams of teams to lead. And she went from being the ultimate tactician to being known as a strategist. Um, and then ultimately to being a, a very senior level leader, leading large organizations where she was known as an enabler, someone who lays out the end goal, the end game, that overall vision and empowers and enables others with the skills and the tools and the resources they need to be successful, but then just kind of steps out of the way and lets people have at it and implement that plan. So based on my conversations with Donna and Ellie and others, I'm going to share a few, um, uh, one particular tool to help you execute that shift in focus from tactician to strategist, and then some questions that you can ask yourself as well. But before we do that, I want to go ahead and show the results of the poll. So coming right up, three, two, one, here we go. Um, so thanks everyone who contributed to the poll. If you've not already done so, we're at pollev.com forward slash leaderly. So open up the browser, type in pollev.com forward slash leaderly and go ahead and vote. And all right, Lauren, now that the numbers are changing, <laughs> why don't you go ahead and read out the results that you see as, as best you can? Yes, of course. And I did just share the link again, if anyone had missed it. Um, but we're seeing the highest 38% at mostly tactical, followed by 34% at a mix of both. And it's changing real time here. I love it. Um, but the, you know, the high scores are definitely, oh, well, now we're shifting. A mix of both is now in the lead um, at 38%. Um, but mostly tactical is uh, close, pretty close behind. Um, I do love the, what the heck does it mean to be strategic? We've got 18% there. Um, and then of course, 9% uh, at mostly strategic. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Hopefully people are uh, a, a little more clear on what it means to be strategic. Um, it's having that forward focused, planful way of, of operating. And in a moment, I'm going to show you how to mine for opportunities to shift your focus in your day-to-day -day tasks. But look, for those of you who said mostly tactical, listen up, um, because I'm going to share some ways to move toward being a bit more strategic, no matter what the role is that you're in today. Uh, for those of you who said a mix of both, um, again, uh, we have some ways to mine for uh, creating a more strategic focus. And for those of you who said mostly strategic, listen up for ways to take that strategic focus to unheard of new heights. Um, and I just want to call out that uh, a couple of you in the chat could really relate to Donna's story. Jennifer, in fact, said uh, that has been exactly me and 
oh my goodness, my dear, Jennifer missed out on a promotion three times because of it. So my friend, I am here for you. And I, I really hope that um, throughout this session, we'll share some ways that, that you can start to shift that perception and step into that role that I know that you're capable of and ready for. Uh, Jennifer said, same here, uh, Jennifer uh, has become the ultimate sharer. Um, and uh, yes, all right, everyone, keep, keep your comments coming in. I'm really enjoying hear, hearing from you during the session. So with that, let's take a look at one of my favorite exercises for shifting your mindset and your focus from tactician to being more of a strategist. And this is what I learned from Donna, in fact, Donna Munch. Um, so what I encourage you to do is this exercise that's called the time portfolio. And it's pretty straightforward. You, 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 you go back to a prior month in your calendar and analyze that month, looking hour by hour, day by day at your activities and color code your activities using one color for where you are being more tactical, you know, the task oriented focus and, it, and use a different color for when you are being more strategic. So, you know, the more forward thinking, planful, um, you know, going after your end goal or vision. And then take a step back and ask yourself, what is there that I could do differently? Um, what are some of the tactical activities I can let go of? And what are some of the more strategic things I could do instead in their place? And so look, if you like the sound of this exercise, I highly recommend taking it on now as part of your homework. In fact, Nancy has just said, Outlook does this now and helps give you some statistics on your work style, which is amazing. Thank you, thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Microsoft and Outlook as well. Um, so look, bookmark this activity if it sounds like it would be of use to you. Analyze that month, color code the tactical versus strate strategic. And I know you probably don't have time right now to do the activity, even though you can outsource it these days to, to Outlook apparently. Um, but I would love if you would just off the top of your head, see if you can think of one tactical activity you'd like to let go of. Um, type it into a chat with a, a slash in between. Um, and then type in a strategic activity you'd like to do more of instead. So don't be shy, type a note into the, ch into the chat. What's one tactical activity you'd like to let go of and step away from? And what's a more strategic thing that you could invest your time in instead? By the way, don't hold back here, my friends, because this is one of my favorite um, activities in the session. And I just love the creativity of this brainstorm and the best practices that get shared. Um, so as you're adding those to the chat, Lauren, do you see any examples that have come in um, that, that you'd like to choose and call out? Um, yes, of course. I think people are still recovering from the mind being blown from Nancy's uh, outlook sharing. Um, but I do see uh, Julie said um, meeting notes. So I would like to let go of meeting notes and uh, do more of long term project planning. Uh, and uh, Padma also chimed in with the more project planning. Um, Janine also kind of echoed with note taking during workshops uh, for letting go of and um, training junior strategists on my team for doing more of. And let's see. Um, I've got here uh, Brandy manual assignment for exceptions to let go of and work on automation for quality reporting to do more of, um, and I will snap my fingers to more automation because I echo that as well. Um, let's see, Jennifer, joining team calls where I do not have anything to add and uh, instead making sure I have something to add that is relevant and strategic. And Debbie mentioned networking for more strategic. Um, Anandi says organizing, 
I can relate to that one too. Um, and let's see what else we've got coming in here. Um, I love it. So many are coming in. Ajanta, not sure if I can let go of any tactical tasks. If I skip any, it'll lead to production incidents. We don't want that. Um, but I would like to meet with others in the company and in my network more often and have conversations on different topics. Uh, and Prasanna has said, executing test cases, planning and identifying math. So I think that executing the test cases would like to let go of and more planning and identifying. Oh, and that's gaps, not math, excuse me. <laughs> um, Fantastic. And, yeah. Yeah, so, so great, everyone. And look, if you're stuck for ideas, we'll look no further than the chat stream. Um, keep them coming. And as I said, this is one of my best parts of this session, uh, just seeing the creativity of the brainstorm and all the fantastic examples that you're sharing. All right, so again, if you like the sound of the calendaring time portfolio exercise, um, or if you're really curious about how you can delegate it to Outlook, <laughs> uh, put this one uh, down as part of your homework coming out of today's session. I'd also like to share three questions asked by strategic leaders that I learned from strategic uh, leaders like Ellie and Donna and others that I interviewed. Three questions that you can ask yourself um, every day if you choose to, uh, to catalyze that shift in focus from tactician to strategist. And as I go through the three, listen out for the one that is going to be most meaningful and impactful for you if you ask yourself that question on a daily basis. Here we go. Three questions that strategic leaders ask themselves. The first is, what's my time horizon? What's my time horizon? Because if you come to work every day asking yourself, what needs to be done this week or today or even this hour or this moment, notice how you're focused on what's immediately in front of you. You're probably operating more as a tactician. However, if you shift your focus to the longer term, that's a way to become more strategic. So shift your time horizon away from the immediate moment and ask yourself what needs to happen this month or six months from today, or one, three, or five years out, that's how you shift your mindset from tactician to strategist by asking, what's my time horizon? Question number two is, what's the scope of my influence? And this one's all about who you're working with and collaborating with and influencing on a daily basis. Because if you're primarily working with a group of closely held peers, who all report into the same manager as you do, that's a sign that you may be being more of a tactician. And so what a strategist does is expand the scope of their influence to a much wider set, working with and collaborating with and influencing across teams, across organizations with a, a much, much wider set. So question number two is, to consider what's the scope of my influence and expand your scope of who you're working with beyond your immediate role and your immediate team. Final question, question number three is, what's the extent of the change that I'm driving? Are you doing the kind of actions that have you chip away at the status quo or are you shaking things up, causing more broad scale, sweeping transformational change of the type that can't be easily undone? That's what strategists do. So question number three is to ask, what's the extent of the change I'm driving? Uh, don't so much maintain the status quo as look for ways to cause transformational change. All right, so uh, according to Donna Munch, even the body language you use can demonstrate whether you're being a tactician or a strategist, because if you're communicating strategy, your arms should be open wide like you're conducting an orchestra. You can't, you can't do that with T-Rex arms. So don't be the tactical T-Rex, be... Uh, be the strategosaurus. So with that, I'd love for you to consider 
the three questions that strategic leaders ask themselves and pick one that's going to be your focus. Which one is going to make the biggest difference to you and shift your thinking from tactician to being more strategic? And go ahead and type one, two, or three into the chat. Is your focus going to be number one? What's my time horizon? So shifting your focus from the immediate future to the longer term. Is it number two? What's the scope of my influence? widening that set that you work with beyond your immediate team to a much wider scope group? Or is it number three, ask yourself, what's the extent of the change that you're driving from supporting the status quo to being a, a transformational change leader? And uh, go ahead and type one, two or three into the chat. And Lauren, this is a very unscientific poll here, but what do you see in terms of the the answers that are most popular here? I am seeing, oh, well, I was seeing a lot of twos, but then it kind of transitioned to a lot of threes. Um, so, uh, oh, and there was also uh, Trinity really liked three, the visual for T-Rex was great, but um, I am seeing a nice even mix, but it does, or, maybe not even mix, a nice mix, but it does seem to be leaning mostly um, towards twos and threes. Got it, got it, all right, great. So just make a note of whichever one you're most concerned with, write it down, add it to your calendar. And all right, Trinity, here's a special treat just for you. Trinity, don't be the tactical T-Rex, <laughs> be the strategosaurus, my friend. <laughs> all right, everyone. So I have one final tip for you for shifting your focus from tactician to strategist. It is give yourself time to think. That's it. That's the whole tip. Just give yourself time to think. So many of the very seasoned strategic leaders that I spoke to make a point of doing this no matter how busy they are. They set aside that unstructured creative thinking and strategic thinking time. So give yourself the gift of time just to think. I'm actually quite interested to hear from anyone who currently does this. Um, type us a note in the chat. Tell us, how are you accomplishing this? So what, what step do you take to, to grant yourself the gift of thinking time? And then how has it benefited you? So what's the impact? So give yourself time to think, are you doing this? If so, how? And what has the impact been for you? Uh, Lauren, do you see an answer or two? Maybe pick two or three to call out and acknowledge. Um, yes, I'm loving. I see, uh, whoa, it just scrolled away. Karen with Ride My Bike. And um, I see Trinity and Tina um, and Miha taking daily walks. Um, and uh, Denise, I make a calendar appointment. So. I love it. I love it, everyone. So give yourself time just to think. And I see Kathy talked about the impact uh, helps with the month monthly retrospective and the six month planning uh, pages. So it helps you kind of get ahead of, of where you are and think in that future focused way. Fantastic examples, everyone. Keep them coming as always. So with that, we are uh, back to our shift list. So um, we've looked at moving from tactician to strategist with the time portfolio exercise and the three questions to ask, as well as giving yourself time to think, are you ready for the next one? All right, ready or not, here it comes. We're moving from doing to delegating. So the second of our five key shifts is moving from doing to delegating. Today, Alice Katwan is Senior Vice President and General Manager of North America Sales with Twilio, um, perhaps pronounced Twilio, if there's anyone who can correct me, feel free. So anyway, she's, Alice is, is the, the, uh, the Senior Vice President and, and GM of North America Sales with that company. Um, 
But early on, about a decade ago, when Alice got her first big promotion to a director level role, her life became a whole lot more chaotic and unpredictable and unmanageable than it had ever felt before. And trying to do it all as a new leader and a, a, a road warrior and a working mom of three young boys literally compromised her health. It made Alice sick. And Alice told me the story of a, of a moment when she found herself lying in a hospital bed with an IV in her arm. And the doctor walked in and looked Alice square in the eye and said, you need to slow down. You need to do less. Or you might not even be here with your family to enjoy all of your success. And that, says Alice, was the moment where she realized that the most successful leaders don't do it all. They don't even try. And enlisting support from others is crucial to your own career success, right? Enlisting support is going to be crucial to your career success. And the best leaders don't try to do it all. Because leadership is not about doing more. It's about shifting from doing to leading. And from this moment forward, I can promise you, it is the tasks that you let go of or say no to um, or, or take a step back from that will define you more as a leader than the things you take on or say yes to or hold on to. Did you get that? From this moment forward, this is my promise, my guarantee to you, the things you let go of will be more defining of you as a leader um, than the things that you take on. So as Alice said, there are just times when you need to admit that you need to let go. All right, so is there something that you need to admit that, that it's time for you to let go of? Maybe go back to our previous exercise of the calendaring, right? What are some of those tactical activities you want to step back from or let go of or uh, hand over to someone else? So what are some of the things that it's time to admit that you just need to, to let go? Um, the comedian Sarah Vowell has said, everything I let go of has claw marks all over it. Don't be like, like Sarah. Admit that you need to let go. Admit that enlisting support is going to be crucial to your success. Because look, the most successful leaders don't just develop, don't just delegate, they delegate, which is one of my favorite words, by the way. Delegate. Do you like that? All right. Repeat after me, everyone. Delegate. Once more with feeling, delegate. All right, what does it mean? So it's about looking around for, for whom, who, who else is around you in the organization for whom this task that you would like to hand off or let go of or delegate to someone, for whom is this task a next step up in their growth and learning and career or leadership development? So... Um, if you're just starting out in your leadership journey, you want to shift from doing to delegating. But if you're more of a practice delegator, it's time to shift from delegating to delegating. So here's a point in the session where I'd love to hear from anyone who has some confidence and experience with delegating or delegating. You know, I love saying that word. Um, type a note into the chat and tell us What's your top tip for delegation or delegation? I'm going to share some of my four keys, um, but I'd love to hear from some of uh, you in the group who are more comfortable, confident, and practiced. What are your top tips for this? And Lauren, I'll, I'll just encourage you to look out for a few to call out. So based on my conversations with leaders like Alice and others, um, here are some tips for moving from doing to delegating to delegating. The first, of course, is to admit that there are times when you just need to let go. You cannot be the one to do it all. And as your responsibilities grow, as do the number of projects that you're responsible for, you can't possibly hold on to everything and maintain the quality of your work. So the first is to admit that you need to let go. Next 
invest the time in delegating. And yes, delegating does make take more time up front because you need to think through um, the task or the assignment or the project that you're handing off and work with someone to enable them and, and coach and guide them and, and help them um, feel like they're skilled up and, and ready for success and maybe guide them back to the right path if they step out, out of the bounds of what's expected. Um, it does take more time, but it is absolutely worth the investment. So step two is to invest the time. The next key is to show people you believe in them. Because as Alice told me, if you hoard tasks that could be just as easily completed by others, you send a message to them that you think they're not up to the task. You might start to have them believe that you don't trust them. So one of the keys to being successful here is to show people that you believe in them. And then also number four is to listen to what inspires people. So this is especially important as you move from delegating to delegating. You want to pay attention to the people around you, their goals, their dreams, but also what motivates or demotivates them. What do they want for themselves? So what fires them up and lights them up and inspires them? Because the better you get to understand the people around you, the more you can understand what they want to do more of in their career. Um, what's interesting, I, I think, about these four keys is that um, most of them you can do at any moment in your career, even if you don't have people reporting to you. Even number two, investing the time. Um, look, if you don't have people to delegate to at work, Think about what you can do in your life outside work to look for assistance, um, to enlist support from others around you. So at this point, Lauren, I want to check in with some from our group as to, um, in addition to my four keys, what are some of the best practices we're hearing? And maybe let's, let's pick like three or four to hear from. Of course, sure. Um, so Holly shared, allow people to have experience at failure, then debrief and learn. Um, and Jennifer said, letting people identify the areas they want to grow in or have a passion for. Uh, oh, and she added later, because it's easier for me to give something to someone if I know they really want it. Um, and Padma shared, creating templates and lessons learned to pass on to the people you're delegating to makes it easier for them to onboard quicker. Um, and finally, I'll share that Brandy shared, my cycle is one round to show and instruct, one time to allow them to lead with my support, and one time on their own with a review session. Ooh, I like that. That kind of went boom for me. Did it go boom for you too, Lauren? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Hey, how about this? It's, it's probably time to award another book winner, a signed hardcover copy of my book. And uh, Brandy, um, I, I think it is yours. <laughs> so uh, Brandy, do you want to do this? Go ahead if you can and just text uh, a note via the chat to the panelists um, and we'll make sure to follow up with you to get that book to you after the session. Um, by the way, Lauren, is that working okay? Are we getting information from Trinity um, and Brandy to- Yes, Oops. I got a direct message from Trinity within Whova, so that worked great. Awesome. Uh, Brandy, if you could do the same, that would be terrific too. Congrats. So with that, everyone, I would love if you would think about what's one step you'll take to move from doing to delegating or to delegating, type one, two, three, or four into the chat, or honestly, feel free to claim um, an idea that came from someone else in the group. Is it number one, admit that you need to let go. Number two, invest the time in delegating. Number three, show people that you believe in them. Or number four, listen to what inspires people. One, two, three, or four, or honestly, uh, pick off something that you learned from someone else in our group. What are you seeing in terms of the numbers, Lauren? Any trends here in our group? Um, well, so Michelle echoed me, all of them, love them all, um, because I feel that way 100%. Um, but I am seeing a bunch of fours. 
Um, I mean, I'm seeing a nice spread here, but definitely uh, I think the the highest might be going to four and listening to what inspires people. Sounds great. <laughs> hey, um, great to everyone. A couple more alls. Janine felt all also. Uh, and Lee shared that um, she's going to share, delegate with her boss because he has a hard time doing this. So I think that was worth calling out. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, delegate to your boss to delegate more if that could even be a, a, a thing. Upward. <laughs> To delegate upwards, I, th I think is what Lee's telling us. All right, everyone, we're moving from tactician to strategist, from doing to delegating. Next up, we're shifting from optimizer to transformer, from optimizer to transformer. And look, I know right now some of you are going, what's wrong with being an optimizer? And the answer is absolutely nothing. But consider this, if you are always coming to work every day, ready to optimize the heck out of the task that you're given, what's immediately in front of you, make it the most productive, effective, efficient, successful as it could possibly be, you're missing out on opportunities. So at some point, you want to shift from optimizing what you're given to do to being a transformer. And a transformer is a transformational change leader. All right. Um, and, and a particular type, because the change that you lead doesn't have to be big, but it does need to be important. And ideally, it should be the type of change that can't be easily undone. So you want to lead change as a transformer that is the type of change that can't be easily wound back, reversed or undone. Think like a pickle. What is a pickle? A pickle is a cucumber that's gone through transformation. The pickle can never go back to being a cucumber again. All right. So I want you to be the pickle that you wish to see in the world and move from being an optimizer to a transformer by leading change that can't be easily undone. Doesn't need to be big, but it does need to be impactful and important change that can't be easily reversed. Layla Fahashimi is the embodiment of a transformational change leader. And today she's the CIO and Vice President of Business Operations with Blackhawk. But uh, a few years ago, when Layla was with another company, PayPal, she was given an audacious change initiative to lead. And Layla was put in charge of transforming the way that 5,000 employees work so that they could become more productive and more customer focused, so that those employees in turn could change the way that citizens of the world use money. All right, so no small change here. Um, and within 18 months, Layla was wildly successful. She and her team led a transformational change um, so that there was a 55% increase in productivity across the entire 5,000 person organization and a 10 times increase um, in the number of new product releases, which if any of you do product releases, that is a jaw meat floor type of result right there. Um, oh, and one small detail that, that you need to know. Layla accomplished all of this with a very small team, very little budget, and almost no positional authority. So how did she do it? Well, Layla shared her keys to being an effective transformer. The first is to get people to agree on the problem because typically when people hear that it's time to, to create change, Layla said people jump to brainstorming solutions and then everyone argues about whose solution and idea is the best. Um, but really what's happening is they're all trying to solve a different problem. So uh, Layla said, if you want to be an effective transformer, first you've got to get people to agree on the problem because one of the most effective ways to influence 
is to rally people around a common cause, a common issue or problem that is meaningful to them. So Layla does her listening tour. She gets out and meets with people and meets with teams until she's gotten that agreement on the problem that they're trying to solve. Next, along the way, she will look out for people who care as deeply about that issue as she does. So step two is to find people who care as much as you do. In her transformation initiative, Layla enlisted the support of 500 people that, that she uh, found along the way who she enlisted as her passionate change champions, her volunteer change leaders. Um, and so each of those individuals was responsible for sharing the message of change um, with a group of their peers. And that's how they were able to reach an entire 5,000 person organization with the message of change. So first get people aligned on and agreeing um, to solve th the same problem. And then you want to enlist your volunteer change champions, the people who care as deeply as you do. And then finally, Layla says, you've got to exude the qualities of an effective transformer. First, you've got to have conviction. So if you don't have real conviction that this change is going to take people and the organization to a better place, good luck trying to convince anyone else. So you've got to show conviction. Next, you've got to have passion because your passion and your enthusiasm becomes infectious and people want to join you. Finally, you've got to have empathy. And I would say of all of the qualities, this one is absolutely critical in the fast changing and very disrupted workplaces that we're dealing with right now. Um, as change leaders, as transformers, we often forget how challenging and even scary and threatening change can be for a lot of people. Um, so we're always kind of thinking 10 steps ahead, but to be effective in leading others through change, you've got to step right alongside them and explain where you're going to go and why, and walk with people through step by step, um, going on that emotional journey with them, because people will sometimes ride the emotional roller coaster, even in the course of a single day. So I, I think right now, one of the most important leadership qualities we can have in our workforces is to show empathy. So I want you to think about a change that you're currently uh, leading or implementing or even one that you're hoping to lead and think about which of the three keys is going to be yours to focus on. Um, all right, you know the drill, type one, two or three into the chat. Is it number one that you'll get people to agree on the problem? Is it number two that you'll look for your passionate change champions, the people who care as much as you do? Or is it number three, that you're going to show conviction and passion and empathy? I'm gonna pause a moment to catch my breath, but also uh, to check in with Lauren. What are you seeing in terms yeah. of the focus? So one came out the gate strong. There were a lot of ones, but then we definitely saw an uptick um, in twos um, and a few threes sprinkled in there as well. Um, All right, good. Lauren, which one stood out for you? Um, you know, I'm consistent in my all. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, part of me is like, oh, agreeing on that problem is so important. Um, and that, you know, starting point to proceed. Um, but then two and three are also just so important. But I think in general, the conviction, passion, and empathy are all such keys for me. So I'd probably go with three. Okay, fantastic. All right, everyone, let's keep moving through the list. So we're shifting from tactician to strategist, from doing to delegating, from optimizer to transformer. Are you ready for the next one? All right, here it comes. We're going to move from order taker to rule breaker. Early on in your career, 
you will earn a lot of credit for doing exactly what your boss tells you, for never coloring outside the lines of your job description, um, and for doing exactly what is asked of you at all times. But of course, your leadership impact will always be limited unless you at some point shift from being a, a good um, order taker to being a rule breaker and a risk taker. Nora Denzel, in fact, who is uh, the um, who, who sits on the board of Ericsson and AMD has said, if you don't take risks, you'll probably always work for someone who does. And I would suggest that the uh, the profile of the rules that you break and the risks that you take can shift through the course of a career. So early on in your career, you probably want to think about taking career risks and breaking career rules, right? So, so you're shaking things up on behalf of yourself and your own career path. For example, uh, maybe you'll volunteer um, for that high profile, high stakes assignment that brings with it the possibility that you might fail and derail. Or maybe uh, you'll relocate to a different department or if even different region or different country. Um, or perhaps you'll be the one to take that courage and boldly speak truth to power. So early on, um, you can build up a tolerance and an appetite for risk taking by taking risks as it relates to yourself and your career. And as time goes by, you might see the, the profile of risk taking shift in favor of taking business risks. So maybe you volunteer to launch a new product or start up a new division or turn around uh, a struggling or a failing team or close down an area that's not profitable. Um, so think about whether your next rule breaking or risk taking adventure is going to be related to your career. So will you break a career rule or take a career risk or are you more likely to break a business rule or take a business risk. Um, feel free to take a, a moment to type your answer into the chat. Is it going to be a career or a business adventure that you take on next? Holly Meidel is someone uh, who's experienced at doing both. She's currently the Vice President of Risk Services at, at Ascension, which is one of the nation's largest healthcare providers. Um, she's had a long and very successful career in risk management. And you might be tempted to think that someone who has had a long career in risk management is all about being risk averse and avoiding risk. Well, you could not be more wrong in your assumption. Holly is a masterful and very experienced rule breaker and risk taker. In fact, earlier on in her career journey, um, when, Ro when Holly was a rising star in risk management, she decided that the most important next step that she could take would be to step away from her career entirely, to spend time at home with her kids while her family was young. And everyone said, you can't do that. That's never been done before. You'll completely derail. And yet Holly knew in her heart that she needed to break the rules. And so she stepped off the career track to spend time at home with her kids when they were little. Now, Holly being Holly, during that time, she volunteered in her kids' schools and in her wider community. And she learned so much about grassroots influencing and leading without authority so that when the moment came that Holly stepped back onto the career and the leadership track, she leapfrogged forward into a national leadership position. Holly even now goes so far as to look for evidence of rule breaking and risk taking on the resumes of people that she hires into her team. And she says, in our current global economy, people need rule breakers and they need risk takers. And by the way, this was a pre-COVID pandemic quote, and we can only imagine how much more true this is right now. Our companies really, really need us to be rule breakers and risk takers in this current global economy and situation. So with that, Lauren, do you see any notes coming in from the group that you'd like to call out about uh, rule breaking and risk taking? 
Yes. So I will say um, first that we have more more than double uh, willing to career risk. Um, but um, I love that Janine said that she has trouble finding partners in crime. Uh, and there's there's this great friendship here that is forming between Janine and Sharon, because Sharon just said, keep on asking, to which Janine felt that they would be great friends. Um, so I'm loving the love in the chat right now. And I'll also share, Gladys said, life adventure with risk sprinkled throughout, check, so. Fantastic. I am loving the love as well. Um, and and I, it's it's so awesome that we have these conversations going on and friends being made in the chat. So um, I want everyone to think about that risk you'd like to take or the rule you'd like to break, be it a career related one, which I know is true for many of you, or a business related rule or rule to take or a rule to break or risk to take. Um, think about what that is, type it into the chat if you're feeling bold and courageous and want to share your example. And either way, I want to share with you the three rules for rule breakers that I learned from Holly. Um, three rules that she learned back in college from one of her professors that she now use, uses as her go-to rules of thumb whenever she wants to break a rule or take a risk. Here they are. Um, the first of the three rules for rule breakers is don't risk a lot for a little. Don't risk a lot for a little. Number two is don't risk more than you can afford to lose. So don't risk more than you can afford to lose. And number three is consider the odds or the potential consequences. All right, great rules to bear in mind if you're hanging out at a casino, but even better rules to keep in mind when you're thinking about taking risks and breaking rules in your career or in the business that you're a part of. So think about that example that came to mind for you and run it by the three rules for rule breakers and see if you can give yourself a go or a no-go decision. Number one, don't risk a lot for a little. Number two, don't risk more than you can afford to lose. And number three, consider the odds or the potential consequences. All right, I'll just pause for a moment. Lauren, do you see anything else worth calling out from our group in the chat? Uh, Lee has shared, my partner in crime and I are trying to transform how software is tested prior to release. Fantastic. Wow. All right. And I will just say that that picture just has me in mush. <laughs> so adorable. All right. Snap poll, everyone. Which was more cute, <laughs> puppy or the koala? You can't possibly hurt my feelings. Oh. Uh, remember the qualifications picture was that more cute or was the puppy more cute um snap poll pop quiz all right christy said koala we're hearing puppy oh the or oh, we're liking the puppy okay all right you maybe hurt my feelings a little bit no, no well maybe just a little bit but yeah they're both very cute all right from cute back to our shift list and we have looked at moving from tactician to strategist from doing to delegating, from optimizer to transformer, and from order taker to rule breaker. Are you ready for the number one shift of them all? Are you ready for the shift that I like to call the grandmother of all of the shifts? The number one shift is, and I'm sorry, everyone, that's all I have time for. Thank you. Goodbye. No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that to you. Here we go. It is shifting from me to we, shifting from me to we. Early on in your career, you are all about your own success, your own productivity, your own learning and development. And yet your leadership impact will always be limited unless you at some point shift your mindset from me to we, no longer focused on being the one to have the best idea or to be the smartest in the room, to be the most productive, the most effective, the most successful. You're all about now being what we call a force multiplier. The person 
whose presence in a group or a team or an organization is a catalyst for the entire group to be more productive, to be more successful, more effective, no longer being the smartest in the room, you aspire to make the entire room smarter. You're about shifting your mindset from me to we. Pam Stewart, who is the Senior Vice President of Retail Sales with the Coca-Cola Company, says, when you move your mindset from me to we, everything changes. And if you aspire to lead boldly and courageously, this, this is the most powerful shift that you can make. All right, everyone, I've opened up a new poll at pollev.com forward slash leaderly. If you have the same browser still open, it should have just refreshed there. And I'm asking you to drop a pin on the pick and tell me which of these shifts is going to be yours to focus on. So pollev.com forward slash literally. Thanks, Lauren, uh, who just pasted that into the chat. Um, pollev.com forward slash literally and drop a pin onto the map and tell us of these shifts, which one is going to be the most important for you to focus on, um, to, to move you forward in your career and leadership development in the next year. I'm going to go ahead and open up the poll results to share on screen. And as I do that, Lauren, um, we probably have a uh, five minutes or so now, maybe a little more for, for questions. So um, Lauren, I'll just encourage you to dig into any questions that may have come in or just put out the call to the group to say, look, now is the time. And just because our chat stream is so abundant in amazing comments, if you could go to the Q&A tab for questions, um, that would be super helpful for me and Lauren right now. Yes. So definitely, um, like Joe said, please uh, add any questions that you have to Q&A. Uh, we do have one from Maria asking, what are the best, best practices to leverage doing less and leading more? All right, best practices to leverage for doing less and leading more. You know what, I'm, I'm actually going to pull you back to the self-assessment based on the calendar. Um, if you go back to that prior month in your calendar and, and start to mine for examples, certainly do that. And then maybe just, you know, put up a sticky note um, or a pop-up reminder just to pause at certain moments in, in the day or in the week, uh, just to create like a running list of things that you could step back from or let go of or do less of. This is also a great one to outsource to people that know you well. So if you have a trusted colleague, like a best friend at work or manager or mentor, tell them that this is something that you're working on. Don't say you're outsourcing to them, um, but say, look, help me um, do a self-observation exercise and, and help me mine for ways that I could do less and lead more. So that would be a great place to start. Um, second place is, and I'm gonna share a way to get the, uh, the, the freebie resources, slides and my newsletter um, in a moment or two, but there's um, a list of 100 leadership qualities. And I really recommend taking 10 minutes to go through the list and identify any that are your leadership strengths. Um, so rather than uh, say lead more, I want you to identify say your top signature strengths and look for ways to focus on those in particular. Hope that helps. Excellent, thank you. And then we have two questions that came in related to we. So the first one from Kira, how to shift to we when there are many disconnected products offered by the company? Oh, interesting. So how to shift to we when there are many disconnected products offered by the company? Um, all right, I'm, I'm going to think on that one for a moment. But look, if anyone else is in a similar situation or you've dealt with that, let's let's hear and tap into the wisdom of, of this group. Lauren, I'd love to hear from you as well. Um, I think for me, um, uh, and, and not knowing your particular situation, I'm going to come back to identifying your top leadership strengths 
and looking for the areas of impact where you can make the biggest difference. So for example, if you're like, I'm a change leader, um, is there a way that you can apply a change leader filter to dealing with all those disconnected products? Like, are there some um, that it's time to retire? Uh, do you see a way to transition to a more focused um, or futuristic product suite that maybe fills an unmet need uh, or fills a gap. Um, so I would just say start with your leadership strengths and then apply that as a filter to understanding how to tackle, um, how to lead your organization through these kind of competing products. Um, that was my best stab at that. Um, Lauren, do you see any uh, other better answers from the group? Well, I don't know that I would say better, but people are chiming in with some comments. Um, Kristen mentioned man mastering the complex sale might reframe things, which apparently is an audio book. Um, and Carrie mentioned there may be global processes that are independent of the product line that could be improved. That might be a good we effort. Mm hmm. Okay, hey, fantastic. Thank you. And, and Lauren, did you have anything to weigh in too from your own experience? Um, I would guess I would just say that even with like your we doesn't have to be a company collective we, it could be the product team we, um, because I imagine that you're not, you know, doing it all alone where there is a team involved that could be your we. Okay, fantastic. I, I, I love it. So the more immediate we rather than the global we. Good. Any other answers coming from our group there? Um, yes. Uh, re multiple products uh, from Kathy, excuse me. I wonder about the product VP if there is a connection to Forge. And Lee also answered um, think inclusively, not separately. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Oh, uh, we have time for at least one more. Um, is there another question that you'd like to pick off the list, Lauren? Um, yes. Well, so I'll add. So Stephanie, related to the we shift, was also asking how you can um, focus on the we shift without it being seen as tactical, as a tactician, excuse me. Oh, I'm so, I'm sorry. I got distracted there for a moment. I was I was. <laughs> could could you repeat that one more time for me? Yes, of course. So related still on the we component. Um, Stephanie was asking, how can I focus on the we shift without it being seen as being a tactician? Oh, so kind of combining a uh, tactician and focused on the we. Um, gosh, you've almost stumped me there. Um, let me defer to the group for a moment. Type your answers into the chat for somebody, everyone. Um, so I, what's interesting is, is that, um, you know, the tactician to strategist is all about where you place your focus. And there might be times when you come to work every day to do something that feels very tactical. But as long as it's tied to your plan that takes you to your longer term goal, you are being a, a strategist. So um, I think you can tie together being the strategist and focusing on the we um, by being the one to remind the entire group that yes, we do have a long-term goal and we do have a plan here. And sometimes you can watch an entire group kind of snap out of the weeds. Um, and actually th there's this great uh, quote from, from Leila Porhashmi, put down the microscope and pick up the telescope. Um, so you can get your entire group to put down the microscope and pick up the telescope by just being the one to remind the team that there is a long-term goal and a long-term plan. So that's a way to um, achieve the shift to strategist and the shift to we both at the same time. How did I do, Lauren? Did, uh, was, was that helpful? Well, I just love that microscope telescope comment you just made. I just frantically wrote that down. I thought that was great. Um, 
And Emily added in here as well on the question, um, it's all about emotional intelligence. If you believe in the we, it will come across to others as tactics for the benefit of everyone, including yourself. Oh, beautiful. I love it. I absolutely love it. Thanks, everyone. Um, all right. So I, I think I might, I might kind of take back the reins here for a moment for a few yeah. closing comments. Um, and I'm also going to share where to grab those resources in just a moment too. But look, after you shift from doing to leading with whatever your chosen shift is, um, don't be the best kept secret in the organization. You've got to make your leadership strengths and your value and your achievements visible. And, and I'm kind of talking about self-promotion here, but in a much more strategic way. Here's the rule of thumb. A, 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 A. All right, what does it spell? That was a trick question. It doesn't spell anything apart from R. Ah. It is an awfully astute acronym. It stands for amplify the accomplishments that align with your aspirations, right? Amplify the accomplishments that align with your aspirations. So when you achieve a result or an impact or something remarkable or noteworthy, don't be shy about amplifying those accomplishments that align with where you want to go. So think strategically about your most important career goal or leadership goal and amplify those accomplishments that align with where you want to go from here. Uh, this is not all, something that comes always easily to us. And maybe, you know, if I'm invited back again next year, we can do a whole session devoted just to getting this right. Um, but for now, if anyone has any methods of amplifying accomplishments, showcasing your achievements that's worked well for you, type a note into the chat. I'd love to hear from you. Let's do this. Let's have the third book available to one of our key commenters who shares an example that you've used to amplify your accomplishments. All right. While you're doing that, I did promise that there'd be a way to stay in touch with me as well as get a hold of the slides and those freebie resources, all of the goodies like the checklist of 100 leadership strengths. I've got a list of 33 ways to amplify your accomplishments. Plus, this will also sign you up for my newsletter. Um, so you can send a text message to 33777. And just type Joe Miller into the text. So text Joe Miller to 33777. Or if you're outside the US, uh, Lauren has just pasted a URL into the chat there. So I would be so honored to stay in touch with you if that's something you'd like to do. Lauren, do we have anyone um, that we can call out for examples of ways to amplify accomplishments? Yes. Um... I really enjoyed uh, Kristen's response that she sends her boss uh, weekly updates, um, which is mostly uh, a short brag sheet. Um, and Sujatha also said sending a note to a larger team of accomplishments by the team. Uh, just sent a note this morning about the successful product release. Um, and let's see here. Uh, Nicole mentioned amplifying, volunteering to speak at team and company-wide meetings, sharing a two-minute win. And Lynn also shared organizing an update presentation meeting where you can show and amplify your accomplishments. Um, and I, we got one more brag sheet here from Janine uh, that a mentor had told her to do many years ago. Um, and she also mentioned it's useful at review time. Yeah, it I sure is. That. Lauren, would you go ahead and, and, and just in a fairly random process, add to our book winners list? Of course, we have Trinity and we have Brandy. Is there one more name that caught your eye in those most recent comments? <laughs> I thought they were all wonderful. I know. Um, but I'm going to go with Janine because I just looked and that's what I saw. 
uh, Janine, text a note to the panelists uh, so we can get in touch with you to get that book to you. And I look forward to staying in touch with everyone um, who has texted Joe Miller to 33777 for my newsletter, uh, slides, freebies, resources, you name it. Um, it's my honor to stay in touch. A couple quick final closing thoughts before we wrap up. The world needs your leadership now more so than ever before, but the tactical still skills that got you to this point won't get you to your next leadership milestone. So to expand your impact beyond what you can accomplish as a solo performer, rethink where you place your attention. Own your leadership strengths. Do less, lead more, engage, inspire, and influence others to collaborate with you and become the powerhouse leader that you were meant to be. All right. And if you want to leave a lasting leadership legacy that long outlives your own lifetime, don't just be a leader and don't be a leader who develops leaders either. I want you to be an L to the power of three. Be a leader who develops leaders who develop leaders. Do you like that? Love it. Are you with me? If so, type L yes into the chat. Type L yes into the chat. Thanks everyone for a fantastic session. It's been such an honor and a pleasure spending time with you. Would you go ahead and raise your right hand, drop a tab behind your shoulders, give yourself a pat on the back and here's a fist bump and sparkles from me. Thanks everyone. And I'm gonna kick Thank it back you. to Lauren at this point. All right, I know we are at the end of time. Thank you all so much um, for this amazing session. Uh, and I will ask everyone, if you could please, in the Whova app, rate this session. There's a button on the screen. I think it says rate session. Um, and if you enter your email, you'll be eligible for some fun prizes. Uh, most importantly, your feedback is important. We really want to hear from you. So thank you so much. Um, and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye, everyone. Bye.